Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and AP English and our World of Ideas lectures. We are in Unit 5. We will finish, actually, Unit 5 with our introduction here, uh, by the way, Unit 5 called Nature, with our introduction here in lecture number 32, Richard Dawkins, very controversial, wonderful, wonderful mind, very dynamic mind. We're going to enjoy learning about Dawkins. Um, All Africa and Her Progenies is the, uh, is the essay title. It actually comes, this comes from uh, River Out of Eden, uh, Dawkins' 1995 uh, volume. Now, there are some important assumptions here right as we get ready to start. One of those is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net for uh, the lectures 1 through 29, especially lectures 28 and 29, where we talked about jo uh, Stephen J. Gould's uh, Non-Moral Nature and then the Kaku lecture that preceded this one. And here's why. I said at the beginning of lecture number 28, when I was talking about Gould, that all three of these thinkers are iconoclastic. Dawkins, very iconoclastic, very much about challenging the religious status quo. Now, we need to make sure that we are reminding ourselves of the value of having certain kinds of positions that, for many of us, are just the ones that we kind of naturally assume to be true, challenged, and Dawkins will certainly do that. Our next assumption is that you understand our learning theory, always the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, right? So we're not just reading material to memorize it. And to that degree in our reading, we're going to do it actively, annotatively. And we're going to answer three guiding questions. What does the text say? Here again, we're going to make sure we do that paragraph outlining. What does the text mean and how can I relate to the information in some way? At, two, at level two, what does the text mean? We are dividing it to a themes, messages, and of course our big five. What does this text say about epistemology? We're going to ask about Dawkins. Is Dawkins an absolutist thinker? He certainly seems to postulate his position is right and the alternate position is absolutely wrong. Does that, to that degree, is he an absolutist thinker? Some have argued that he is. I'm going to make the argument that I think Dawkins is really more of a fallibilist than, he, than many people want to uh, admit about him. Uh, that is to say, I think I'm right, I could be wrong. What does this text say about ontology and who we are? What does this text say about psychology, the individual mind, sociology, the group mind? And then this question of theodicy. Why is there pain? Why is there suffering in the world? And does it have any meaning at all, any value at all? Because one of the obvious questions, Dawkins, a great atheist thinker, following in the, in the tradition in many ways of Bertrand Russell, one of the questions that's always posed to an atheistic thinker is, if you are an atheist and you don't believe in God, then how can you constitute, what, constitute any notion of right and wrong? And how can you deal with issues of pain and suffering? Where do you find the meaning in the universe without some kind of a deity to provide that understanding? Dawkins has a lot of good answers, I think, to that question. Challenging answers is what I mean by good, okay? Finally, at level three, we'll ask at 3A, how can I relate this information to other texts, certainly to the Kaku text, as well as to the Stephen Jay Gould text that we've just studied, as well as in Unit 5, the Francis Bacon for Idols essay, as well as the cutting for Charles Darwin uh, from Origin of Species. We'll try and put them all together in some way and hold them in our idea and in our mind. It's fascinating that we are in the section on nature. Jacobus doesn't call it science, he calls it nature, this unit. And then we're going to meet in our next unit, culture, and then in the unit after that, a unit called faith, where we're going to be looking at some religious texts as well as some um, essays that critique ideas of religious texts, like Nietzsche's Apollonian Dionysian. It's fascinating the way language is often used to create these divisions, as I said in our conversation in Lecture 28. We'll obviously have to pick this one up now. And we're not afraid of ideas. We'll say this again here in a bit. We're going to pick up any idea. Let's meet now the great Richard Dawkins. Born in 1941, as of uh, today in the year 2020, he's 78 years young. He's an English uh, writer, right? Ethologist as well as evolutionary biologist and a prodigious author. Um, Emeritus Fellow of New College in Oxford. Um, he became fa famous first in 1976 with a book called The Selfish Gene. He popularized the gene central view of evolution and he invented in many ways or introduced the term to public parlance, the, the term that you guys all know of as meme, so that um, anytime you think of meme, you can think about Dawkins. In 2006, he founds the Richard Dawkins Foundation for a Reason in Science. 
He is an outspoken atheist um, and in 2006 published The God Delusion. Now, I think it's important that we hear what Jacobus has to say as he's introducing us to this thinker. I'm on page 450. He says, in all Africa and her progenies, and by the way, Dawkins was born in Nairobi, Africa. In all Africa and her progenies, Dawkins primarily presents the case for the existence of one common ancestor for all human beings. In the process, Dawkins explores the nature of the genetic code that marks all individuals and species. And we should point out, Francis Collins, writers like Francis Collins and others, have responded to Dawkins over the years since this essay, in fact, was written. So again, just like our comments on Kaku as well as Stephen Gould, you want to go and look at the research that's been done since this essay was published. Dawkins, to continue Jacobus, explains the relationships of species such as humans, primates, horses, and pigs in terms of the number of different genetic markers they share because the genetic markers of specific areas of the genetic code are the same for individuals of the same species but vary increasingly as the species become distant. The, uh, the number of differences between yeast and horses is greater than the number of differences between pigs and horses. And then just to finish, Dawkins tells of an experiment using genetic samples from 135 women from different ethnic groups and locations that suggest that our common ancestor is African Eve, a female from whom we all descend. Dawkins explains the complexities involved in making such a claim, including his assertion that all living beings probably trace their lineage back to Africa. Now, uh, Dawkins' rhetoric, let's just uh, spend a moment here, no question, two things for your notes. Definitely argumentative, no doubt about it. He is clearly playing the role of iconoclast. And again, we, we define that term iconoclastic, iconoblastic, the ability to go after sacred cows, ideas that are considered to be precious within a culture, and to attack them in some way. So the tone will be argumentative. Um, but I'm still going to argue that it's a still it's a it's a pretty colloquial tone, and it will involve a certain kind of maybe dark humor at times. Um, the other thing we want to point out is his use of metaphor. Carefully used device. We'll pay attention when he does that as well. Okay. Since we do have a number of paragraphs in this essay, let's go to work with all 47 of them, starting with paragraphs one through four. He says, some people contend that scientific explanations of human origins are no more true than those of myth or religion. But in fact, scientific beliefs are based on verifiable evidence, whereas myths and faith are not. Now this opening four paragraphs again resurrects the question I asked at the beginning of lecture 28 about Plato's cave allegory. Individuals sitting in the cave, chained up, thinking shadows on the wall are real, until one of them is dragged out into the light of the sun to recognize that the shadows on the wall are in fact not real. But the question is, and, and it's interesting how both people who are involved in science and study of science, as, like Dawkins, as well as religious peoples, will use this myth to, uh, of the cave allegory to their advantage. The obvious question is, what constitutes knowledge that will in fact show what is real versus not real? Notice, right away Dawkins is going to make an observation that science produces verifiable evidence while myths and religions can't do that. This is obviously the subject of huge debate, which is why some of you love to listen to Jordan Peterson so much, because he brilliantly, I think, deconstructs an idea like this. And of course, you can look at uh, uh, the debate conversations, debates that Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris have had. I mean, you can take a look on, on YouTube to see those. And, and, and no, this topic is still alive, wonderfully alive, I would say. Paragraph 5. This chapter explains an important scientific theory of human origins, the theory of African Eve. So notice right away, after making some kind of, uh, let me tell you where I stand in terms of epistemology, and notice it seems to be a pretty powerful absolutist position that he takes epistemologically speaking. Now he's ready to talk about African Eve. Paragraph 6 through 8. A simple mathematic calculation shows that each person now on earth had at least a trillion trillion ancestors alive 2,000 years ago, but this calculation is obviously flawed because it does not consider shared ancestry. In effect, all human beings are cousins much more closely related than is generally recognized. Now, this idea is a compelling idea, sociologically speaking. That is to say, we're all connected in some profound way. Now, St. Augustine would say, the Adam and Eve story postulates the same notion as well. Of course, notice Dawkins is going to say, I don't need a story of myth to be able to explain this. Some will argue that then what Dawkins creates in his African Eve is one of the beautiful myths of science. Let's take a look at it. Paragraphs 9 through 10. 
A branching tree is a common model for describing ancestry or descent. A better model is that of a river of genes. And again, this is a famous, a famous word picture of Dawkins flowing through time, constantly mixing our genetic material. In any large crowd, there are probably many people whose genes will be mingled one day in shared descendants. Paragraphs 11 through 13. A similar crowd from the distant past could be divided into two groups, those who are ancestors of everyone now alive and those who are not. Even further back, we could find a lobe-lined fish that is ancestor to us all. But we don't need to go that far to find a common ancestor. Paragraphs 14, 15. In 1930, now he starts to use the historical precedent looking backwards. In 1930, Sir Ronald Fisher speculated that, with some exceptions, our common ancestry dates back about 2,000 years. Today, molecular biology enables us to go beyond speculation and trace our origins to a single ancestor, African Eve. Paragraph 16. Just as scholars can trace the path of a biblical text that's been copied and passed down through time, so scientists should be able to trace human ancestry by examining DNA, the genetic text written in our bodies. Francis Collins, the head of the Genome Project for many years, has had a lot to say as well in, in, in this notion. Paragraph 17 through 19. Unfortunately, sex is a major obstacle to tracing DNA. Biblical scholars face only minor copying errors in the text they trace, but scientists must deal with the scrambling of DNA texts caused by the mixing of male and female chromosomes. What makes this essay so fascinating is the way in which Dawkins references challenges that biblical um, scholars have versus challenges that geneticists have. Paragraph 20 through 22. There are two cases in which sexual missing is not a problem. African Eve, which will be discussed later, and cross-species relationships. DNA texts taken from different species show how those species are related. We can determine, for example, how closely we're related to horses, pigs, and yeast. And by the way, I love that Dawkins uses the word text to talk about DNA. Again, texts. We are the stories we tell, the stories we retell. Think about how DNA plays that game. Dawkins is making the argument. There's a powerful, there's another powerful metaphor for the word text. Paragraphs 23 through 25. The molecular clock theory suggests that we also can determine when a given species branched off on its own evolutionary pathway. This determination is possible in part because different genetic texts change over time at different rates and with different effects. Makes sense. Paragraph 26, to determine how recently we can claim common ancestry with all humans, we must study a type of DNA evidence different from that used to establish our connections with other species. Now he's going to get into some science. Paragraphs 27 through 30, that evidence is found in mitochondria. Bacteria-like bodies swimming in all of our cells. Mitochondria have their own DNA, which is passed down from one generation to the next strictly through the maternal line. In other words, the DNA in mitochondria does not undergo the sexual mixing that scrambles other genetic texts in our bodies. Mitochondria thus pr provide an uncontaminated record of human ancestry. And again, there's been a whole lot of research done since Dawkins printed this essay. And I, I would challenge you to go take a look at it. It's way more complicated than Dawkins could have ever even imagined. Paragraphs 31 through 32. Though uncontaminated, mitochondrial DNA does mutate over time, and these mutations indicate how far back our ancestors diverged in the female-only line. Mitochondrial DNA is ideal for dating common ancestry within a species. Paragraph 33. A group of researchers in Berkeley, California, studied mitochondrial DNA from 135 women worldwide, using a computer to analyze how the women might be biologically related. Paragraph 34 through 36. Some coincidental similarities exist among DNA of different species, such as horses, pigs, yeast. Within a single species, such as humans, the rate of coincidence among individuals is much higher. Therefore, in analyzing the DNA data, the Berkeley researchers programmed their computer to find the most parsimonious family tree, the one with the fewest coincidental resemblances. And by the way, since this essay was written, a whole lot of research has been done on this, and even about this research at Berkeley itself. You can do that research on your own. Paragraphs 37 through 39. But even the fastest computer couldn't analyze every possible family tree relating the 135 women. So researchers used random sampling to reduce the size of the task. Paragraphs 40 through 41. The researchers at Berkeley concluded, one, that the grand ancestress of us all lived in Africa. 
end quote, the so-called African or mitochondrial Eve, and two, that this Eve lived between 150 to 250,000 years ago. Paragraph 42, the African Eve theory claims, and notice, and this is why I'm going to argue that, that Dawkins is not strictly the absolutist that many want to make him out to be. Notice in paragraph 30, 42, he does call this a theory, not a fact. He calls it a theory. It's a working idea. To that degree, he is a fallibilist. That is to say, if we can come up with a better idea, I'm more than happy to enjoy it. The African Eve theory claims that if we go back a few hundred thousand years, all living humans are of African descent. Even if this Eve is not African, we know from fossil evidence that our more remote ancestors going back millions of years are in fact African. You can do the research on that. Pa uh, paragraphs 43 uh, through 44. The research at Berkeley has spawned two misunderstandings. The first is that African Eve was the only woman on Earth. The correct claim is that while she had many male and female companions, African Eve is the most recent woman from whom all modern humans are descended in the female only line. The other misunderstanding is that African Eve is our most recent common ancestor. The correct claim is that she is our most recent common ancestor only in the purely female line. There are many other lines of descent besides this one, obviously. Paragraph 45, and now to finish through 47. Actually, because males are capable of producing more children than females, our most recent common ancestor is somewhat more likely to be male than female. So again, see, notice, we've got some speculation that's happening here. And finally, paragraphs 46, 47, we can state six conclusions based on this preceding discussion of, um, uh, of African Eve. The story of African Eve is a small part of the much grander span of human evolution. I'm with you on 468, by the way, for these uh, conclusions in, in paragraph uh, 46. He summarizes everything in paragraph 46. He says, we may come to the following conclusions. First, it's necessarily certain that there existed one female whom we may call uh, mitochondrial Eve, who is the most recent common ancestor of all modern humans down the female-only pathway. It's also certain, too, that there existed one person of unknown sex whom we call the focal ancestor, who is the most recent common ancestor of all modern humans down any path. Third, although it's possible that mitochondrial Eve and the focal uh, ancestor are one and the same, it's vanishingly unlikely that this is so. Fourth, it is somewhat more likely that the focal ancestor was a male than a female. Fifth, mitochondrial Eve were uh, very probably lived less than a quarter of a million years ago. Six, there's a disagreement over where mitochondrial Eve lived, but the balance of informed opinion still favors Africa. Only conclusions five and six depend upon inspection of scientific evidence. The first four can all be worked out by armchair reasoning from common knowledge. All right, let's go ahead now and just finish the essay quickly with our big five. Epistemologically, well, I've already said it, but I don't, I don't think that Dawkins in this essay is as absolutist as many people make him out to be. It is possible that you could argue that there's a certain kind of scientism at play here when science becomes dogmatic and absolutist in its epistemological rendering. I'm not sure Dawkins at all ever is really that absolutist in his thinking. I think he comes across that way to make his point, but I think it's pretty clear that if he's a scientist, if you can present evidence otherwise, verifiable evidence, I think Francis Collins has shown that you know you can be a scientist and you can actually challenge some of what Dawkins believes. I think that the fallibilist position makes the most sense to look at in regards to uh, to Dawkins. I think he's waiting for more data, and, I, and obviously a whole lot of data has come in since he wrote this essay. No question. What does this text say about ontology? Beautiful. We're all related in some way. There's something majestic and beautiful about that ontological view, right? Psychologically, well, the power of fear, no, no question can control us and keep us from wanting to ask certain kinds of questions. That's obviously buried innately inside, inside of this essay. Sociologically, beautiful. We're all connected in some powerful way. The only way we're ever going to go forward and evolve is together. Theodicy, well, I think that um, this is an interesting question. While he doesn't, uh, Dawkins doesn't deal with it directly, it's pretty clear that his view is that we do create a lot of our pain through misunderstandings and unwillingness to investigate, we might say. Messages here at 2A, again, the beautiful one, I think, is that we're all connected in some powerful way. That's that line from um, Peter Jackson's film, you'll maybe remember. We're, you're a part of this world, aren't you? We're all connected in some way, Tolkien's, Tolkien's 
uh, rendering of that. I think you could read all of the Lord of the Rings from that perspective. Of course, another major message here for Dawkins is key, uh, key to survival, reason. Got to have it. Got to have reason to be able to survive. Of course, does this mean that Dawkins doesn't believe in love? No, I, I don't think so, and I think he would recognize the power of love. The challenge, obviously, is where can we, how, how can we think about uh, this notion of evolutionary roots and all of that? At 2B, we mentioned the brilliant tone, and uh, it's very clear, concise writing, as most scientific writing will be, and the use of the metaphor and the word picture as well. At 3A, obviously, we're going to ask you to consider how this essay works with the essays that we've studied in unit number five, from Bacon's Four Idols to Darwin's Origin of Species, and then, of course, to Gould, as well as Kaku's essays as well. We've mentioned already uh, other thinkers. I, I just say again, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris right now in our time uh, are, are probably discussing these topics in more powerful ways than about anybody else. I would recommend that you maybe take a look at that. Or Ken Wilber's Marriage of Sense and Soul is another text that a number of you have enjoyed reading as being an attempt to try to work out this idea of the debate between religion and science. Finally, in 3B, what do you think of this idea that we're all somehow, you know, interrelated, intertwined, connected in some profound way? I mean, as you look around the room at each other, are you willing to say, I am fundamentally related to that person in my genes? What an, what an interesting notion. And yet it seems to me a powerfully compelling idea, right? We're all responsible for each other in some beautiful way. Thank you.